Mr. President, it's been a long time since you sat down with an American television network, almost three years, I think. Thank you for your time. Uh, there's a lot to discuss. I hope we have time to get to uh, all of the issues. Uh, but I want to begin uh, with uh, some news from the US uh, just today. Um, in the US, it's reported that Russia is preparing, perhaps within months, to supply Iran with an advanced satellite system enabling Tehran to track military targets. Is that true? Would you mind repeating the question again? That we are preparing to hack what kind of facilities? No, it's, it, the, the report today is that uh, Russia is preparing to give or to offer to Iran uh, satellite technology which will enable Iran to target uh, military, to make, to, to make military targets. <laughs> no. 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 We don't have that kind of programs with Iran. No. We, it's just nonsense all over again. Yet again, we have cooperation plans with Iran, including military and technical cooperation, and all of this fits the framework of the decisions that were agreed upon in our program in regard to Iran's nuclear program in the context of UN decisions, together with our partners in the preparation of the Joint Comprehensive plan of actions, whereby at some point sanctions, including in the area of military and technical cooperation, should be lifted from Iran. We do have certain programs, but they all concern conventional weapons, if it gets that far. However, we haven't even gone to that stage yet. We don't even have any kind of real cooperation, even in the conventional weapons area. So if anybody is making something up regarding modern space-based technology, this is just plain fiction. This is just fake news. At the very least, I don't know anything about this kind of thing. Those who are speaking about it probably know more about it. It's just nonsense. So presumably you'd agree that giving Iran satellite technology that might enable it to target U.S. servicemen and women in places like Iraq uh, or to share that information with Hezbollah or the Houthi in Yemen so they could target Israel and Saudi Arabia, that giving Iran that kind of uh, satellite technology would be dangerous. Look, why are we talking about problems that don't exist? There is no subject for a discussion. Somebody has invented something, has made something up. Maybe this is just a bogus story in order to limit any kind of military and technical cooperation with Iran. I will say once again, this is just some fake information that I have no knowledge about. For the first time, I'm hearing about this information from you. We don't have this kind of intentions, and I'm not even sure that Iran is even able to accommodate this kind of technology. This is a separate subject, a very high-tech subject. Yes, indeed, we don't rule out that cooperation with many world nations and us is possible in space, but probably everybody knows very well our position in terms that we are categorically against space militarization altogether. We believe that space should be free from any and all kinds of weapons located in near-Earth orbits. That is why we don't have this kind of plans, or any plans, especially concerning the transfer of technology of the level that you have just described. So let's move on to your summit with President Biden. Uh, the context for the summit is that he is meeting with the G7, a group that you used to belong to, uh, with NATO, with European uh, leaders. <laughs> President Biden has defined his first trip to Europe as, quote, about rallying the world's democracies. Uh, he views you as a leader of autocrats 
who is determined to undermine the liberal democratic order. Is that true? Well, I don't know. Somebody presents it from a certain perspective, someone else looks at the development of the situation and at yours truly in a different manner. All of this is being offered to the public in a way that is found to be expedient for the ruling circles of a certain country. The fact that President Biden has been meeting up with his allies, there is nothing unusual about it. There is nothing unusual about a G7 meeting. We know what G7 is. I have been there on numerous occasions. I know what the values are in that forum. When people get together and discuss something, it's always good. It's better than not to get together and not to discuss. Because even in the context of G7, there are matters that require ongoing attention and consideration because there are differences, strange as it may seem. There may be differences in assessments of international events on the international arena and among themselves. Very well then, let them get together and discuss it. As far as NATO, I have said on many occasions, this is a Cold War relic. It's something that was born in the Cold War era. I'm not sure why it still continues to exist. There was a time and there was some talk that this organization would be transformed. Now it has been kind of forgotten. We presume that it is a military organization. It is an ally of the United States. Every once in a while it makes sense to meet up with your allies, although I can have an idea how the discussion goes along there. Clearly everything is decided by consensus. However, there is just one opinion that is correct, whereas the other opinions, all of the other opinions, are not quite that correct, putting it in careful terms. Well, there we go. Allies are getting together. What's so unusual about it? I don't see anything unusual about it. As a matter of fact, it's a sign of respect to the U.S. allies before a summit between the U.S. and Russian presidents take place. Probably it is being presented as desire to find out their opinion on the key issues of the current agenda, including those issues that President Biden and I will discuss. However, I'm inclined to think that despite all of these niceties, the United States, as far as their relationship with Russia, will be promoting what they consider important and necessary for themselves, above all for themselves, for their economic and military interests. However, to hear what their allies have to say about that probably never hurts. This is a working procedure. So let's talk about uh, your uh, meeting uh, with President Biden, <coughs> the summit that will happen after those meetings. Uh, President Biden asked you to meet with him. He didn't make any preconditions. Were you surprised? No. We have a bilateral relationship that has deteriorated to what is the lowest point in recent years. However, there are matters that need a certain amount of comparing notes and identification and uh, determination of mutual positions so that matters that are of mutual interest can be dealt with in an efficient and effective way in the interests of both the United States and Russia. So there is nothing unusual about it. In fact, Despite this seemingly harsh rhetoric, we did expect those suggestions because the U.S. domestic political agenda made it impossible for us to restore the relationship at an acceptable level. This meeting should have taken place at some point. So President Biden launched this initiative. Prior to that, as you will know, he had supported the extension of the START treaty, which of course was bound to meet with support from our side, because we believe that this is a treaty in the area of containment of strategic offensive weapons. It has been worked through and thoroughly and meets our interests and meets the U.S. interests. So this offer could be expected. Will you go into the summit uh, agreeing uh, to begin uh, more arms control talks immediately after the summit? Because, as you mentioned, President Biden has extended New START by five years. Washington would like that to be the beginning, not the end of that conversation. 
Мы знаем, какие вопросы, We know what matters and what problems Americans want to discuss with us. We understand these questions, matters and problems. We are prepared for this joint work. We have certain, if not differences, then different understandings of what pace, at what pace and in what directions we need to be moving. We know what constitutes priorities for the U.S. side and Generally speaking, this is a process that needs to be advanced at the professional level along the lines of the Foreign Ministry and Defense Ministry on the Russian side and Pentagon and the State Department on the U.S. side. We are prepared for this work. We've heard signals that the U.S. side would like to see these negotiations resumed at this expert level of professionals. We will see if the conditions for this have been created following the summit. Of course, we're not saying no. We are prepared to do this work. President Biden wants predictability and stability. Is that what you want? Well, these are the most important things. This is the most important thing. This is the most important value, if you will, in international affairs. Sorry to interrupt you, but he would say that you have caused a lot of instability and unpredictability. Well, he says one thing, I say another thing, but maybe at some point, in certain ways, our rhetoric varies and is different, but if you ask my opinion now, I'm telling you what it is. The most important value in international affairs is predictability and stability. And I believe that on the part of uh, our U.S. partners, this is something that we haven't seen in recent years. What kind of stability and predictability could there be if we remember the 2011 events in Libya, where the country was essentially taken apart, broken down? What kind of stability and predictability were there? There has been talk of a continued presence of troops in Afghanistan, and then all of a sudden, boom, the troops are being withdrawn from Afghanistan. What? Is this predictability and the stability again? Now, the Middle East events, is this predictability and stability, what all of this will lead to, or in Syria? What is stable and predictable about this? I've asked my U.S. counterparts, you want Assad to leave? Who will replace him? What will happen when somebody replaces him? The answer is odd. The answer is, I don't know. Well, if you don't know what will happen next, why change what there is? It could be a second Libya or another Afghanistan. Do we want this? No. Let us sit down together, talk, look for compromise solutions that are acceptable for all the parties. That is how stability is achieved. It cannot be achieved by imposing one particular point of view, the quote-unquote correct point of view, whereby all the other ones are incorrect. That is not how stability is achieved. Let's get to some of those issues. Um, I want to just talk a little bit more yes, about please. your relationship with President Biden. Um, this will not be the Helsinki summit. Uh, President Biden is, is not President Trump. Uh, you once described President Trump as a bright person, talented, how would you describe President Biden? Well, even now, I believe that former U.S. President Mr. Trump is an extraordinary individual, talented individual. Otherwise, he would not have become a U.S. President. He's a colorful individual, and you may like him or not. And he didn't come, of course, from the U.S. establishment. He had not been part of big-time politics before. And uh, some like it, some don't like it, but that is a fact. President Biden, of course, is radically different from Trump because President Biden is a career man. He has spent virtually his entire adulthood in politics. He has been doing it for a great deal of years, and I have already said that, and that is an obvious fact. Just think of the number of years he spent in the Senate and how many years he was involved in matters of... Uh, 
international politics and disarmament virtually at the expert level. That is a different kind of person, and it is my great hope that, yes, there are some advantages, some disadvantages, but there will not be any knee-jerk reactions on behalf of the sitting U.S. president, and that we will be able to comply with certain rules of engagement, certain rules of communication, and we'll be able to find points of contact and uh, common points. That's uh, about it. And what will actually happen, we will need to live and see based on the actual practical policies and results thereof. Well, President Biden says, uh, one time when you met, you were inches away from each other, close to each other. And he said to you, I'm looking in your eyes and I can't see a soul. And you said, we understand each other. Do you remember that exchange? As far as soul, I'm not sure. One has to think about what soul is. But I do not remember this particular part of our conversations, to be honest with you. I do not remember. We all, when we meet, when we get together, when we talk, when we work, we strive and achieve for some solutions, we all proceed from the interests of our nations and our states, and this is fundamental and is the bedrock of all our actions and intentions. And this is the driving force and the motive for organizing meetings of this kind. And as far as soul goes, that's something for the church. Yeah, you're a religious man. President Biden is saying he told you, to your face, you don't have a soul. <laughs> I do not remember this. He says it was about, it was 10 years Maybe ago. Maybe there is something wrong vice president, he says. with my memory. Well, he probably has a good memory. I, I do not rule this out, but I don't remember this. Generally, in personal encounters, people try to act appropriately. I do not remember any inappropriate elements of behavior on the part of my counterparts. I don't think that anything like that has happened. Would you have felt that was an inappropriate thing to say? Well, that depends on the context. It depends on what form they're set in. You know, one can say it in different ways. It can be presented in different ways, but generally, people meet up in order to establish a relationship and create an environment and conditions for joint work with a view to achieving some kind of positive results. If one is going to have a fight with somebody else, why bother and have a meeting to begin with? One is better off looking into budget and social policies domestically. We have many issues that we have to resolve. What's the point then? It's just a waste of time. Of course, one can present this for domestic political consumption, which I believe is what has been done in the United States in the last few years, where the US-Russia relationship was sacrificed for the sake of a fierce political strife inside the US. We can see that. We know it well. We have been accused of all kinds of things, election interference, cyber attacks, and so on and so forth. And not once, not once, not one time did they bother to produce any kind of evidence or proof, just unfounded accusations. I'm surprised that we have not yet been accused of provoking the Black Lives Matter movement. That would have been a good line of attack. What do you think? We of, did not do that. What do you think of the Black Lives Matter movement? I think that, of course, this movement was used by one of the political forces domestically in the course of uh, election campaigns. But there are some grounds for it. Let's remember Colin Powell who was Secretary of State, and he was also in charge of the Pentagon. 
Even he wrote in his book that even he, as a high-ranking official, had felt some kind of injustice towards himself his entire life, as someone with a dark complexion, even from the USSR days. And in Russia, we have always, always treated with understanding the fight of African Americans for their rights. And there are certain roots to it. There is a certain foundation for this. But no matter how noble the goals that somebody is driven by, if it reaches certain extremes, if it spills over into extremism, acquires elements of extremism, we cannot approve this. We cannot welcome this. So our attitude to this is very simple. We do support African Americans' fight for their rights, but we are against any types and kinds of extremism, which unfortunately, sometimes, regrettably, we witness currently these days. You mentioned cyber, you mentioned cyber attacks um, and deny any involvement uh, by Russia. Uh, but Mr. President, there is now a weight of evidence, a long list of alleged state-sponsored cyber attacks. Let me give you five. There's a lot, but it makes a point. Uh, the US intelligence community says Russia interfered with the 2016 election. Election security officials said Russia tried to interfere with the 2020 election. Cybersecurity researchers said government hackers targeted COVID vaccine researchers, hacking for COVID vaccines. In April, the Treasury Department said the SolarWinds attack was the world's worst with, including not, with targets including nine federal agencies. And just before your summit, Microsoft says it's discovered another attack with targets including organizations that have criticized you, uh, Mr. Putin. Mr. Pres President, are you waging a cyber war against America? Dear Kier, you have said that there is a weight of evidence of uh, cyber attacks by Russia. And then you went on to list those official U.S. agencies that have stated as much. Is that what you did? Well, I'm, telling, I'm giving you information about who said it so you can answer. Right. Right. You are conveying information to me as to who said that, but where is evidence that this was indeed done? I will tell you that this person has said that and that person has said this, but where is the evidence? Where is proof? When there are charges like that without evidence, I can tell you, you can take your complaint to the International League of Sexual Reform. Will you be happy about it? This is a conversation that has no subject whatsoever. At least put something on the table so that we can look and respond. But there isn't anything like that. The latest thing, as far as I know, one of the latest attacks, was against a pipeline system in the U.S. Right, yes. So, what? But this is, but the, 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 your, your mention. Just, just, ju just a moment. As far as I know, the shareholders of this company even made a decision to pay the ransom. They paid off the cyber gangsters. If you have listed an entire set of U.S. special services, powerful, respectable, global, after all, they can find whoever the ransom was paid to. And once they do that, I hope they will realize that Russia has nothing to do with it. Now, there's some kind of a cyber attack against a meat processing plant. Next time, they will say there was an attack against some Easter eggs it's becoming farcical, like an ongoing farcical thing, a never-ending farcical thing. You said plenty of evidence, but you haven't cited any proof yet again. But this is an empty conversation, a pointless conversation. What exactly are we talking about? You've moved on to this question of uh, ransomware and, and, and criminals. Uh, Russian-speaking criminals, is the allegation, are targeting the American way of life, food, gas, water, hospitals, 
uh, transport. Why would you let Russian-speaking criminals disrupt your diplomacy? Wouldn't, don't you want to know who's responsible? You know, the simplest thing to do would be for us to sit down calmly and agree on joint work in cyberspace. And we did suggest that to Mr. Obama's administration. We started in uh, September during his last year in office, in, no, in, in October at first. They didn't say anything. Then in November they came back to us and said that, yes, it was interesting. Then the election was lost. We restated this proposal to Mr. Trump's administration. The response was that it is interesting, but it didn't come to the point of actual negotiations. There are grounds to believe that we can build an effort in this area with the new administration. We hope that the domestic political situation in the United States will not prevent this from happening. But we have proposed to do this work together. Let's agree on the principles of mutual work. Let's find out what we can do together. Let's agree on how we will structure counter efforts against this process that is gaining momentum. We here in the Russian Federation have a cybercrime that has increased many times over in the last few years. We're trying to respond to it. We're looking for cyber criminals. If we find them, we punish them. We are willing to engage with international participants, including the United States. You are the ones who have refused to engage in joint work. What can we do? We cannot build this work. We cannot structure this work unilaterally. Well, I'm not the government, Mr. Putin. I'm just a journalist asking uh, I understand you, that. Uh, questions. But if you, you clearly want to negotiate, you must have something to negotiate with. Uh, you, you don't ask for a truce unless you're fighting in a war. You know, as far as the war, NATO, officially, I'd like to draw your attention to that. NATO has officially stated that it considers cyberspace a battlefield, an area of military action, and conducts military exercises in that and battlefield. And you're involved in that battlefield. Russia is fighting on that battlefield, correct? No, no, no. Really? That is not correct. Really? If we wanted to do that, NATO did say that it considers cyberspace an area of combat, and it prepares and even conducts exercises. What stops us from doing the same? If you do that, we will do the same thing. But we don't want that. Just like we don't want space militarized, in the same manner we don't want cyberspace militarized. And we have suggested on many occasions agreeing on mutual work in the cybersecurity ah, area. It, it, I, but your government refuses to. Isn't, I, mean, I saw your proposal from, from September, from just in September. Isn't what you're proposing that if you can come to an agreement over hacking and election interference, then you'll call off the hacking and the election interference if America agrees not to comment on your elections and your political opponents? What we count on is that nobody should interfere in domestic processes in other countries, neither the U.S. in ours or we in the U.S.A. or any other nations. All nations of the world should be given a chance to develop calmly. Even if there are crisis situations, they have to be resolved by the people domestically, without any influence or interference from the outside. But I don't think that this call by the U.S. administration is worth anything. It appears to me that the U.S. government will continue to interfere in political processes in other countries. I don't think that this process can be stopped because it has gained a lot of momentum. However, as far as joint work in cyberspace to prevent some unacceptable actions on the part of cyber criminals, that definitely is something 
that can indeed be agreed upon. And it is our great hope that we will be able to establish this process with our U.S. partners. If you were in America, what would you fear might happen next? The lights being switched off the way they were in Western Ukraine in 2015? I don't understand. You mean, if I were an America, what would I be afraid of if I were an American, or, or what? what? What should Americans worry? What might happen next if there's no agreement on cyber? You know, this is the same as space militarization. This is a very dangerous area. At some point in the past, in order to achieve something in the nuclear area, in terms of confrontation in the area of nuclear weapons, the USSR and the United States did agree to contain this particular arms race. Cyberspace is a very sensitive area. As of today, a great deal of human endeavors rely upon digital technologies, including the functioning of government. And of course, interference in these processes can cause a lot of damage and a lot of losses. And everybody understands that. And I'm repeating for the third time, let's sit down together and agree on joint work on how to achieve security in this area. That is all. What is bad about it? I don't even understand. I'm not asking you, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but for me, as an ordinary citizen, it would not be clear and understandable. Why is it that your government refuses to do it? Accusations keep coming, including up to interference and involvement in a cyber attack against some kind of a meat processing plant. But in the meantime, our proposal to start negotiations in this area are being turned down. This is some kind of nonsense, but that's exactly what's been happening. I repeat one more time. It is my hope that we will be able to start engaging in positive work in this area. In terms of what's to be afraid of, why is it that we suggest agreeing on something? Because what people can be afraid of in America, the very same thing can be a danger to us. U.S. is a high-tech country. NATO has declared cyberspace an area of combat. That means they are planning something. They are preparing something. So obviously, this cannot but worry us. Do you fear that uh, American intelligence is deep inside Russian systems and has the ability uh, to do you a lot of damage in cyber? I'm not afraid, but I bear in mind that it is a possibility. Let me ask you about uh, human rights, uh, an issue that uh, President Biden uh, will raise, uh, Mr. President. He'll raise the uh, issue of Alexei Navalny, targeted for assassination, now in a Russian jail, Mr. President, why are you so threatened by opposition? Who says that I feel threatened by opposition or we're threatened by opposition? Who told you? Who, who told you that? <laughs> well, well, a Russian court has just... Well, uh, well a, a Ru excuse me, I'm sorry. A Russian court has just outlawed organizations connected to Mr. Navalny. Uh, literally every non-systematic opposition figure is facing criminal charges. In journalism, a Medusa and V Times have been hit with foreign agent labels uh, and, and face collapse. Mr. President... It's as if dissent is simply not tolerated in Russia anymore. Well, you are presenting it as dissent and intolerance towards dissent in Russia. We view it completely differently. You have mentioned the law on foreign agents, but that's not something that we invented. That law was adopted back in the 1930s in the United States the law on foreign agents. And that law is much harsher than ours, and it is intended, among other things, at preventing interference in the domestic political affairs of the United States. And on the whole, I believe, but, 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 it is justified. But Mr. President, but Mr. Do, you want me, do you want me to answer? Would I'm you like me gonna, to answer? Would you in like America, me to keep answering? we call what you're doing now whataboutism. 
what about this, what about that? It's a way of not answering the question. Uh, let me ask you a direct question. Did you, did you, did you... Let me I will, ask you I will, a, I will look. Let me ask you. I, I will look. No, no, let, let me answer it. You've asked me a question. You're not liking my answer, so you're interrupting me right away. This is inappropriate. So there we go. In the United States, this law was adopted a long time ago. It's working, and sanctions under that law are much harsher than here, up, and include, up to and including imprisonment. Yes, 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 correct. Again, you're not letting me, but I, I will revert to us. Do not worry, I will go back to us. I will not remain focused on U.S. problems. Exclusively, because I will Mr. revert Mr. President, and go I, back I and comment, your, comment on what's happening here. I thought your uh, belief was that nations shouldn't intervene in other countries' domestic affairs. Correct. Shouldn't Correct. comment on other countries' politics. But there you are doing it again. No. No. If you muster some patience, and let me finish saying what I mean to say, everything will be clear to you. But you are not liking my answer. You don't want my answer to be heard by your audience. That is the problem. You're shutting me down. Is that free expression, or is that free expression the American way? Please answer. So, thank you very much. Here we go. The U.S. adopted this law. We passed this law only very recently in order to protect our society against outside interference. In some of the states in the U.S., if a foreign observer approaches a polling station, the prosecutor says, come a few feet closer and you'll go to jail. Is that normal? Is that democracy in the modern world? But that is an actual practice in some of the states. We don't have anything like that. When I talk about these laws, about non-interference or attempts at interference, what do I mean as applied to Russia? Many entities of uh, the so-called civil society, the reason I say so-called is because many of those entities are funded from abroad. Specific relevant action programs are prepared, their core members are trained abroad, and when our official authorities see that, then in order to prevent this kind of interference in our domestic affairs, we make relevant decisions and adopt relevant laws. And they're more lenient than yours. You have, we have a saying, don't be mad at the mirror if you're ugly. It, it, it has nothing to do with you personally. But if somebody blames us for something, what I say is, why don't you look at yourselves? You will see yourselves in the mirror, not us. There is nothing unusual about it. As far as political activities and the political system, it is evolving. We have 44 registered parties, well, th 30, 34, I think, and 32 are about to participate in various electoral processes across the, the entire country in yes. September. Yes. We only have a limited amount of time, Mr. President. There is also non-systemic opposition. You have said that some people right. have been detained, some Those people are, that are, are in prison. prison. Yes, that is all true. You have mentioned certain names. Yes, yes, I, 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 will, I will talk about it. I will not leave any of your Alexei questions Navalny unattended. Is, is it, it, Can I ask it, it you, may I just ask you a direct question? Did you order Alexei Navalny's assassination? Of course not. We don't have this kind of habit of assassinating anybody. That's one. Number two is, I want to ask you, did you order the assassination of the woman who walked into the Congress and who was shot and killed by a policeman? Do you know that 450 individuals were arrested after entering the Congress, and they didn't go there to steal a laptop? They came with political demands. 450 people have been detained. You're talking about a capital They're rise. looking at jail time between 15 and uh, 25 years. And they came to the Congress with political demands. Isn't that persecution for political opinions? 
Some have been accused of plotting to take over government power. Some are accused of robbery. They didn't go there to rob. The people, the individuals whom you mentioned, yes, they were convicted for violating their status of individuals who had been previously convicted and given suspended sentences. Twice an individual was given suspended sentences. Essentially, it was a warning not to violate the Russian laws. And he completely ignored the requirements of the law. The court went on and turned the conviction into real jail time. Thousands and thousands of people ignore requirements of the law, and they have nothing to do with political activities in Russia every year, and they go to jail. If somebody is actually using political activities as a shield to deal with their own issues, including to achieve their commercial goals, then it's something that they have to be held responsible for. There you go again, Mr. President. What about America when I've asked you about Russia? Uh, let me ask you, you mentioned Congress. Let me ask you another direct question that you uh, can answer. And it's an allegation that has been made, an accusation that has been made again and again now uh, in the United States. Uh, the late John McCain uh, in Congress called you a killer. When President Trump was asked, uh, was told that you are a killer, he didn't deny it. When President Biden was asked whether he believes you are a killer, he said, I do. Mr. President, are you a killer? <laughs> Look, over my tenure, I've gotten used to attacks from all kinds of angles, and from all kinds of directions, under all kinds of pretexts and reasons, and of different caliber and fierceness. And none of it surprises me. People with whom I work and with whom I argue on the international arena, we're not bride and groom. We don't swear everlasting love and friendship. We are partners, and in some areas, we are rivals. As far as harsh rhetoric, I think that this is an expression of overall U.S. culture. Of course, in Hollywood, because we did mention Hollywood at the beginning of our conversation, there are some deep things that undoubtedly can be referred to as works of uh, cinematic art, but more often than not, it's macho behavior, and that is also part of U.S. culture, including political culture, and it is considered normal. By the way, not here. It is not considered normal here. If this rhetoric is followed by a suggestion to meet and discuss bilateral issues and matters of international policies, I see it as desire to engage in joint work. If this desire is serious, we are prepared to support it. I don't, I don't, I don't think I heard you answer the question, the direct question, uh, Mr. President. I did answer. I did. I will add, if you let me, I have heard dozens of such accusations, especially during the period of some grave events during our counter-terrorism efforts in North Caucasus. And when it happens, I'm always guided by the interests of the Russian people and the Russian state. And sentiments in terms of who calls somebody what, what kind of labels, this is not something I worry about in the least. Mm. Yeah, uh, let me give you some names. Anna, Anna Polakovskaya, shot dead. Alexander Litvinenko, poisoned by polonium. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky, allegedly beaten and died in prison. Boris Nemtsov, shot moments from the Kremlin, moments from here. Uh, Mikhail Lessin, uh, died of uh, blunt trauma in Washington, D.C. I mean, are all of these a coincidence, Mr. President? <laughs> Look, you know, I don't want to come across as being rude, but this looks like some kind of indigestion, except that it's verbal indigestion. You mentioned many individuals who indeed suffered and perished at different points in time for various reasons at the hand of different individuals. You've mentioned Lesson. Lesson used to work in my administration. I liked him very much. He perished in the United States, died or perished. I'm not sure which. We should ask you how exactly he perished. I regret to this day that he is not with us anymore. In my opinion, he's a very decent individual. As far as the others, 
we found some of the criminals who committed those crimes and some are in prison and we are prepared to continue to work in this mode and uh, along this avenue identifying everybody who violate the law and by their actions cause damage including to the image of the Russian Federation however just piling everything together is meaningless inappropriate and baseless if one sees this as a line of attack, then very well. Let me listen to it one more time, but I repeat, I have heard it many times, but this doesn't baffle me. I know which direction to move in, in order to secure the interests of the Russian state. Let's move on uh, to Belarus and Ukraine, uh, two uh, issues that will certainly come up in, in your summit uh, with uh, President uh, Biden. Uh, did you have prior knowledge that a commercial airliner would be forced to land in <coughs> Belarus and that a, a journalist would be arrested? No. I did not know about this. I didn't know about any airliner. I didn't know about the individuals who were detained there subsequently. I found out about it from the media. I didn't know. I didn't have a clue about any detainees. I don't know. It is of no interest to us. You appeared to approve of it, uh, judging by your meeting with President Lukashenko soon afterwards. Not that I approve of it. Not that I condemn it. But, well, it happened. I said recently in one of uh, my conversations with a European colleague, I told him about the version of Mr. Lukashenko, who told me about it. He said that information had been given to them, that there was an explosive device on board the plane. They informed the pilot without forcing the pilot to land, and the pilot made a decision to land in Minsk. That is all. And you believe that? Why should I not believe him? Ask the pilot. It's the simplest thing. Ask the chief pilot. Ask the commander of the aircraft. Did you ask him if he was forced to land? Because I have not heard or seen an interview with the aircraft commander that landed in Minsk. Why not ask him? Why not ask him if he was forced to land? Why don't you ask him? It's actually even odd. Everybody accuses Lukashenko, but the pilot hasn't been asked. You know, I cannot but recall another similar situation where the plane of the president of Bolivia was forced to land in Vienna at the orders of the U.S. administration. Air Force One presidential plane was forced to land. The president was led out of the aircraft. They searched the plane. And you don't even recall that. Do you think it was normal? So that was good. But what Lukashenko did was bad? Look, let us speak the same language. And let us use the same concepts. If, well, Lukashenko is a gangster, how about the other incident then? Was it good? In Bolivia at the time, it was seen as humiliation of the entire country. But everybody kept mum in order to not aggravate the situation. Nobody is recalling that. By the way, this is not you're, you're the only situation you're, you're, of this kind. With respect, you're recalling it. But so if it is Lukashenko, that means example, you gave him an example to follow. We are talking about a commercial <laughs> flights. Shouldn't people be able to take a commercial flight across Europe without fear of being shot down, like in the case of <coughs> MH17, or forced down so that a dictator can arrest a journalist? Yes. 
Look, I will tell you one more time. What President Lukashenko told me, I don't have any reason not to believe him. For the third time, I'm telling you, ask the pilot. Why don't you ask the pilot? Was he being scared? Was he being forced? The fact that information appeared that there was a bomb on the plane, that individuals, people had nothing to do with politics or any kind of domestic conflicts, that they could perceive it negatively, could worry about it, of course that's a bad thing, there is nothing good about this. And obviously we condemn everything that has to do with this, and international terrorism and the use of aircraft and so on. Of course we're against this. And you've told me that the landing of the aircraft of the president of Bolivia is a completely different matter. Yes, it is different, except that it is ten times worse than what was done, if anything was done, in Belarus. But you just won't acknowledge it. You are ignoring it. And you want millions of people around the world to either not notice it or forget about it tomorrow. You won't get away with it. It won't happen. In the case of neighboring Ukraine, uh, earlier this year, the European Union said you had more than 100,000 uh, troops on the Ukrainian border. Uh, was that an attempt to get Washington's attention? <laughs> Look, first, Ukraine itself constantly and I think is still doing that. It kept bringing personnel and military equipment to the conflict area in the southeast of Ukraine, Donbass. That's one. Two is that we conducted exercises in our territory, and not just in the south of the Russian Federation, but also in the Far East and in the North and in the Arctic. Simultaneously, military exercises were being held in different parts of the Russian Federation. At the very same time, the U.S. was conducting military exercises in Alaska. Do you know anything about it? Probably not. But I'll tell you that I do know. And that is in direct proximity to our borders. But that's in your territory, on your land. We didn't even pay attention to it. What is happening now? Now, at our southern borders, there is a war game, Defender Europe. 40,000 personnel, 15,000 units of military equipment, Part of them have been airlifted from the U.S. continent directly to our borders. Did we airlift any of our military technology to the U.S. borders? No, we did not. But many of those, Why are you worried many of those exercises are, res are a response to your actions, uh, Mr. President. Do you worry that your opposition to NATO has actually strengthened it? For six years, NATO has spent more on defense. That's some defense. Some defense. During the USSR era, Gorbachev, who is still, thank God, with us, you can ask him, got a promise, a verbal promise. However, it was a promise that there would be NATO expansion to the east. Where are those promises? Two waves of expansion. Where is that, where is that written down? Where is that promise written down? Right, 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 right. Well done. Well done. Correct. You've got a point. Nya, nya, nya. Got you good. Well, congratulations. Of course, everything should be sealed and written on paper. But what was the point of expanding NATO to the east and bringing this infrastructure to our borders? And all of this before saying that we're the ones who have been acting aggressively? Why? On what basis? Did Russia, after the USSR collapsed, present any threat to the United States or European countries? We voluntarily withdrew our troops from Eastern Europe leaving them just on empty land. Our people there, military personnel, lived there for decades in what was not normal conditions, including their children. We went to tremendous expenses. And what did we get in response? We got in response infrastructure next to our borders. And now you're saying that we're threatening to somebody. We're conducting war games on a regular basis, including sometimes surprise military exercises. Why should it worry the NATO partners? I just don't understand this. Will, will you commit now not to send any further Russian troops into Ukrainian sovereign territory? Look, 
Did we say that we were planning to send our armed formations anywhere? We conducted war games in our territory. How can this not be clear? I'm saying it again because I want your audience to hear it. I want your listeners to hear it, both on the screens of their television sets and on the Internet. We conducted military exercises in our territory. Imagine if we sent our troops into direct proximity to your borders. What would have been your response? We didn't do that. We did it in our territory. You conducted war games in Alaska. God bless you. But you had crossed an ocean, brought thousands of personnel and thousands of units of military equipment close to our borders, and yet you believe that we are acting aggressively, and somehow you are not. Just look at that. Pot calling the kettle black. Uh, moving on. Um, the Biden administration has said that in your, at your summit they will bring up uh, the case of two U.S. prisoners in Russia, um, Paul Whelan and Trevor Reed. Uh, they are two former uh, Marines. Uh, Trevor Reed uh, is uh, suffering from uh, COVID in prison. Uh, why don't you release them ahead of the summit? Wouldn't that show goodwill? I know that we have certain U.S. citizens who are in prison, have been convicted, but if one considers the number of Russian Federation citizens who are in U.S. prisons, then these numbers don't even compare. The United States in recent years has made a habit of catching Russian Federation citizens in third countries and okay. taking them in violation of all international just, legal norms and put them time, in Mr. prison. President. Unless we can have more time, I'm very happy to, have, to keep going for another 30 minutes. I control the time here, so don't worry about time. Your guy, the Marine, he's just a drunk and a troublemaker. As uh, they say here, he got himself shit-faced on vodka and started a fight. Among other things, he hit a cop. It's nothing. It's just a common crime. There's nothing to it. As far as possible negotiations on this subject, sure, it can be talked about. Obviously, we'll raise the matter of our citizens in prison in the United States. Yes, it can be a specific conversation, sure. We're happy to do it, although it doesn't seem that the U.S. administration has raised that matter. But we're prepared to talk about that. Our pilot Yaroshenko has been in prison in the U.S. for a good, I don't know how many years, 15, maybe 20 years. And there, the problem also seems to be a common crime. We could and should talk about it, but we haven't been talking about this, but we could. If the U.S. side is prepared to discuss it, so are we. So his family will find that incredibly distressing to hear you talk about him that way. It does sound, though, as if you would consider some kind of a prisoner swap. There is, there is nothing offensive about it. He got drunk on vodka and started a fight. He fought a cop. There is nothing offensive about it. These things happen in life. There is nothing horrible about it. It happens to our men as well. Somebody gulps down some vodka and starts a fight. So you violate the law, you go to prison. What would have happened if he'd fought a cop in your country? He would have been shot dead on the spot, and that's the end of it. Isn't that the case? And on the prisoner swap question, is that something that you would consider? Are you looking to negotiate? You're meeting with the president? Yes, 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 of course, of course. Even better would be a discussion of the possibility of entering into an agreement on extradition of individuals who are in prison. This is a standard international practice. We have such agreements with several countries. We are prepared to enter into such an agreement with the United States. And just to be clear, so we hear it from you, which Russian prisoners in the U.S would you be hoping to bring back to Russia by name? Well, we have a whole list. I've just mentioned our pilot, a pilot named Yaroshenko, who was taken to the U.S. from a third country and was given a rather lengthy sentence. He has some serious health issues, but the prison administration is not paying attention to this. You have mentioned that your citizen 
has uh, coronavirus, but nobody is paying attention to the health issues of our citizen. We are prepared to discuss these issues. Moreover, it makes sense, as you correctly said, and I completely agree with you, there are matters of humanitarian nature, and why not discuss them as long as they pertain to the health and life of specific individuals and of their families, of course, sure thing. Just quickly, before I move on, on the subject of prisons, again with Alexei Navalny, will you commit that you will personally ensure that Alexei Navalny will leave prison alive? <laughs> Look, such decisions in this country are not made by the president. They're made by the court, whether or not to set somebody free. As far as the health, all individuals who are in prison, that is something that the administration of the specific prison or penitentiary establishment is responsible for. And there are medical facilities in penitentiaries that are perhaps are far from the best condition, and uh, they're the ones whose responsibility it is, and I hope that they do it properly. But to be honest, I have not visited such places for a long time. I did visit one in St. Petersburg some time ago, and there was a very grave impression that was made on me by the medical facilities in uh, a prison. But since then, I hope some things have been done to improve the situation. And I proceed from the premise that the person that you have mentioned, the same kind of measures will apply, not in any way worse than to anybody else who happens to be in prison. That can be said for sure. His name is Alexei Navalny. People will note that you were I don't prepared care. to say I don't that care. he would leave Please prison alive. Look, look. Please listen to me carefully. His name can be anything. He's one of the individuals who are in prison. For me, he's one of the citizens of the Russian Federation who has been found guilty by a Russian court of law and is in prison. There are many citizens like that. By the way, our so-called prison population, the people who are in prison, in the last few years has been reduced by almost 50 percent, which I consider a big victory for us and a major sign of the fact that our legal system is becoming more humane. So he will not be treated any worse than anybody else. Nobody should be given any kind of special treatment, it would be wrong. Everybody should be in an equal situation. This is called the most favored nation treatment, not worse than anyone else. And the individual that you have mentioned, that applies to him as well. I appreciate the extra time, Mr. President. The team has been in quarantine for almost two weeks, so this interview is very important to us. Uh, I want to ask you about China. Um, China is working on its fourth aircraft carrier. It has two. Russia has one, and it's not in, in service at the moment. Uh, China refused to take part in arms control talks last year. You complain so much about NATO to your west. Why do you never complain about China's militarization to your east? The first thing I want to say is that over the last few years, the last few decades, we have developed a strategic partnership relationship between Russia and China that previously had not been achieved in the history of our two nations. A high level of trust and cooperation and in all areas, in politics, in the economy, in technology, and in the area of military and technical cooperation. We do not believe that China is a threat to us. That's one. China is a friendly nation. It has not declared us an enemy, as the United States has done. China hasn't been... Don't you, don't you know anything about this? So that's number one. Number two is that China is a huge powerful country, one and a half billion people. In terms of uh, purchasing power parity, the Chinese economy 
has exceeded the size of the U.S. economy. And in terms of trade, for the previous year, last year, China tied Europe for the first place, whereas the U.S. dropped to the second position. Do you know about this? China has been developing, and I understand that what's beginning to happen is a certain, well, certain kind of confrontation with China. Everybody understands it. We can see it. Why hide from this or be scared by these issues? However, we're not alarmed by it, including among other things, the fact that our defense sufficiency, as we call it, is at a very high level, including because of this. But the most important thing is the nature and level of our relationship with China. You said China will have four aircraft carriers. How many does the United States have? A lot more. <laughs> there you go. That's my point. Why would we worry about the Chinese aircraft carriers? On top of everything else, we have a vast border with China, but it's a land border. What, do you think the Chinese aircraft carriers will be sent to cross our land border into our territory? This is just a meaning, meaningless conversation. But you, you also have a Pacific coast. But you're right, there will be four of them. Yes, there will be four of them. Coast? Well, the coast is huge, but the bulk of the border between us and China is a land border. And yes, you're right that there will be four of them, because one needs to be in maintenance, one needs to be on combat duty, one needs to be in repairs. There is nothing excessive here for China. That is why what you said, that China won't engage in negotiations, arms control. It refuses to ne negotiate reductions in nuclear offensive weapons. You should ask the Chinese about it, whether it's good or bad. It's up to them. But their arguments are simple and they're understandable. The level, both in terms of the amount of ammunition and warheads and delivery vehicles, the United States and Russia are far, far ahead of China. And the Chinese justly ask, why would we make reductions if we are already far behind what you have? Or do you want us to freeze our level of nuclear deterrence? Why should we freeze? Why we, a country with a billion and a half population, cannot at least set the goal of achieving your levels? These are all debatable issues that require thorough consideration, but making us responsible for China's position is just comical. Uh, what do you think of China's treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang? You know, <coughs> I have met certain Uyghurs. It's always possible to find individuals who criticize the central authorities. I have met Uyghurs on my trips to China, and I assure you, at the very least, from what I heard with my own ears, that on the whole, they welcome the policies of the Chinese authorities in this area. They believe that China has done a great deal for people who live in this part of the country from the perspective of the economy, raising the cultural level, and so on and so forth. So why should I offer assessments looking at the situation you, you know from them. You outside? Know there are, indeed. You know, you know there are many uh, Uyghurs who do not say that, and that America has accused China of genocide. The Secretary of State has accused China of genocide uh, over the Uyghurs. Uh, there is the accusation of a million uh, Uyghurs in so-called concentration camps. Is, is that your message to the Muslim communities in the former Soviet Union? You don't think anything wrong is happening there? As far as the Muslim community in Russia, I need to give a message 
to it through the policies of the Russian authorities vis-à-vis -vis Muslims in the Russian Federation. That is how I need to give my message to the Muslim community in the Russian Federation. Russia is an observer in the Organization of Islamic Conference. About 10% of our population, perhaps a little more, are Muslims. They are citizens of the Russian Federation who do not have another fatherland. They are making a colossal contribution to the development of this country, and that pertains to both clerics and ordinary citizens. Why should I speak to and build a relationship with this segment of our population by reference to the situation in China without understanding thoroughly what is happening there. I think you're better off asking about all these problems. The foreign minister of the Chinese People's Republic or the State Department. It's just a question of whether you are prepared to criticize China. China, for example, abstained on Crimea at the Security Council. Uh, China's biggest banks have not contravened American sanctions against Russia. Uh, do you think you get 100% support from China? You know, we are neighboring countries. One does not choose one's neighbors. We are pleased with the level of our relationship, which, as I said, is unprecedentedly high, as it has evolved over the last few decades, and we cherish it, just like our Chinese friends cherish it, which we can see. Why are you trying to drag us into some kind of issues that you evaluate as you see fit for building your relationship with China. I will tell you completely honestly. Can I be completely honest? Please, yeah. We can see attempts at destroying the relationship between Russia and China. We can see that those attempts are being made in practical policies. And your questions, too, have to do with that. I have set forth my position for you. I believe that this is sufficient, and I am confident that the Chinese leadership, being aware of the totality of these matters, including the part of their population who are Uyghurs, will find the necessary solution to make sure that the situation remains stable and benefits the entire multi-million strong Chinese people, including its Uyghur part. You understand, of course, I, I'm just trying to question you about Russia's position in relation to China and the United States. Let me ask you in a, yeah, let me ask you in a different way. Are you splitting off from the U.S. space program and moving forward with China? No, no. Why would you say that? We are prepared to work with the U.S. in space, and I think recently the head of NASA said that he could not imagine development of uh, space programs without its partnership with Russia. We welcome this statement, and can, 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 we I'll just, I'll just explain, it. because the, the head of the Russia space agency has threatened uh, leaving the International Space Program in 2025 um, and specifically talked about sanctions um, in relation to that threat. Well, honestly, I do not think that Mr. Rogozin, which is the name of the head of Roscosmos, has threatened anyone in this regard. I've known him for many years, and I know that he is a supporter of expanding the relationship with the United States in this area in space. Recently, as I said, the head of NASA spoke in the same vein, and I personally fully support this, and we have been working with great pleasure all of these years, and we're prepared to continue to work. For technical reasons, though, and that is a different matter, is that the International Space Station is coming to an end of its service life, and maybe in this regard, Roscosmos does not have plans to continue their work. However, based on what I heard from our U.S. partners, they too are looking at future cooperation in this particular segment in their own 
way. But on the whole, the cooperation between our two countries in space is a great example of a situation where, despite any kinds of problems in political relationships in recent years, it is an area where we have been able to maintain and preserve the partnership, and both parties cherish it. I just think that you misunderstood the head of our space agency. We are interested and I assure you, in continuing to work with the U.S. in this direction, and we will continue to do so if our U.S. partners don't refuse to do that. It doesn't mean that we need to work exclusively with the U.S. We have been working and will continue to work with China, which applies to all kinds of programs, including exploring deep space. And I think there is nothing but positive information here. Frankly, I don't see any contradictions here. Let me let me ask you one more way just to understand the relationship between China, Russia and the America. If the People's Liberation Army made a move on Taiwan, uh, how would Russia respond to that? <laughs> Are you aware of uh, China's plans to militarily solve the Taiwan problem? I don't know anything about that. As we frequently say, politics do not require the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is inappropriate in politics. There is no could be and uh, would be in politics. I cannot comment on anything that is not a current reality of the modern world. Please bear with me. Don't be upset with me, but I think that this is a question about nothing. This is not happening. Has China stated that it intends to solve the Taiwan problem militarily? It hasn't happened so far. For many years, China has been developing its relationship with Taiwan. There are different assessments. China has its own assessment. The U.S. has a different assessment. Taiwan may have its different assessment of the situation, but fortunately, it hasn't come to a military clash. I'm being told to wrap up, but if I could just uh, ask you a couple more questions. Sure, please, um, go ahead. Our own, and our, our own Andrea Mitchell uh, saw just this month uh, the last border crossing into Syria, uh, where supplies literally keep people alive. Um, you're threatening to close that crossing in July uh, at the Security Council. Uh, why would you do that, knowing that it will cause the death of refugees? Look, unfortunately, there are already a great deal of tragedies there, and all our actions in their totality need to be geared at stabilizing the situation and bringing it into a normal course of events. And with support of Russia, Syria, the Syrian authorities have been able to bring back under their control over 90 percent of the Syrian territory. What needs to be set up now is humanitarian assistance to people irrespective of any kind of political context. However, our partners in the West, in the West in general, both the United States and uh, the Europeans, have been saying that they're not going to give any help to Assad. What does Assad have to do with it? Help people who need that assistance, just the most basic things. They won't even lift restrictions on supplies of medications and medical equipment, even in the context of the coronavirus infection. But that is just inhumane. And this kind of cruel attitude to people cannot be explained in any way. As far as the border crossings, for delivery of humanitarian assistance. There is the Idlib area where combatants are still robbing people, killing people, raping people. There is the Al Tanf zone, which, by the way, is controlled by the U.S. military. Recently, we caught there a group of gangsters who had come from there, and they directly said that they had specific goals as far as Russian military facilities. As far as border crossings, our position is such that assistance needs to be given just as it should be done in the entire world and as it is provided for in the rules of international humanitarian law through 
the central government. That is how assistance should be given, and it should not be discriminated against. And if there are grounds to believe that the central government of Syria will plunder something, will steal something, will set up observers on the part of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent who will oversee everything. I don't think that anybody in the Syrian government is interested in stealing some part of this humanitarian assistance. It just needs to be done through the central government. And in this sense, we support President Assad because a different mode of behavior would be undermining the sovereignty of the Syrian Arab Republic, and that's all. As far as the Idlib zone, the Turkish troops there effectively control the border between Turkey and Syria, and convoys cross the border without any restrictions on their numbers in both directions. Mr. President, you extended the constitution so that you could be president of, of Russia until 2036. Do you worry that the longer you are in power and without any sign of someone to replace you, the more instability there may be when you finally do choose to leave office? What will collapse overnight? If we look at the situation in which Russia was in uh, the year 2000, where it was balancing on the brink of preserving its territorial integrity and sovereignty, and the number of individuals living below the poverty line was colossal, it was catastrophic. The GDP level had dropped below anything that's acceptable. Our effects and gold reserves were 12 billion, whereas our foreign debt was 120 billion, if we count it in dollars. Now the situation is different. There are many problems, but the situation is completely different. Of course, somebody will come and replace me at some point. Why would all of this collapse? We've been fighting international terrorism. We have nipped it in the bud. Is it supposed to come back to life? I do not think so. Another matter is that on the political arena, different people may emerge with different points of view. Well, great. Very good. You know, I have linked my entire life to the fate of my country to such an extent that there isn't a more meaningful goal in my life than the strengthening of Russia. If anybody else, and if I see that person, even if that person is critical of some areas of what I have been doing, if I can see that this is an individual who has constructive views, that he or she is committed to this country and is prepared to sacrifice his entire life to this country, not just a number of years, no matter his personal attitude to me, I will make sure, I will do everything to make sure that such people will get support. It is a natural biological process. At some point, naturally, someday, we will all be replaced. You will be replaced at where you are, I will be replaced at where I am, but I am confident that the fundamental pillar of the Russian economy and statehood and its political system will be such that Russia will be firmly standing on its feet and looking to the future confidently. And would you look from that person for some kind of protection the same way that you offered to Boris Yeltsin when you took over. I'm not even thinking about that. These are third-tier issues. The most important thing, the single most important thing, is the fate of this country and the fate of its people. Very good. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. President. Uh, we've gone over and I really appreciate it. Uh, it was a really interesting conversation, so thank you.